once again that God has blessed us to be able to come together to worship Him, to think about and praise Him for heaven, to sing about this wonderful, wonderful, uh, sweet by and by that we are striving to make our way towards as we are pilgrims and strangers in this world. Heaven is certainly uh, the, the blessing that we're striving for. So appreciate uh, that reminder. Appreciate that opportunity to be able to, to give God thanks and glory for all that He's done for us and for preparing such a place. Thankful that you're out here with us this morning. That you've come here. We hope that you've come here today to study God's Word, to learn some things that we hope will be beneficial, that we hope will edify and help each of us to grow uh, a little closer to God than we were when we came here this morning. We're getting the lesson this morning. I want to set the stage, if you will, for what we're going to be talking about. I kind of alluded to this last Sunday night. So I want to read some passages from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 5. In Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 5, Paul comes across some, some individuals who have been taught about the Lord, but they've not been taught the full picture. Uh, that is to say, they've not been taught about being baptized into Jesus for the remission of their sins, being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It says that it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, Indeed, uh, to them Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so here we have the, the account here of Paul coming across these individuals in the city of Ephesus, and he teaches them uh, in a more clear manner the gospel of Jesus. They heard uh, most likely from Apollos in the previous chapter that he's mentioned there, how that he taught about Jesus, he taught about the gospel, but he didn't know uh, in, in beyond the baptism of John, John the Baptist that you read about in the gospels. And so they needed to know the same message that the apostle Peter was preaching in Acts chapter 2. You recall in Acts 2 verse 38, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And so there was a reason why Peter taught them to be baptized in the name of Jesus in order to receive the remission of sins. So Paul comes across these men here at Ephesus. And he finds that they too, having heard about Jesus and having heard the gospel, have heard most of it, but they've not heard the part that, that Peter preached about in Acts 2, that men have been preaching about in the, in the preceding chapters here of the book of Acts, up until this point. And so he teaches them about Jesus. He teaches them about being baptized in the name of Jesus. And then we're told that they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, if you continue studying, you find that the re one of the reasons why, besides Acts 2.38, that Paul is teaching them this is so that they can get into Christ. Paul would go on to write in the book of Romans chapter uh, 6 and in the book of Galatians chapter 3. In Romans 6, 3 through 6, and in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, Paul would write to us that it is when we are baptized that we get in Christ. Now, the reason why I want to lay this groundwork is because we started to study for the book of Ephesians last Sunday night. And the book of Ephesians is written to those who we just read about in Acts 19 who have heard the word of God, believed it, repented of their sins, <coughs> confessed that Jesus is the Son of God, and were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of their sins in order to be put into Christ. And that is important because when we study the book of Ephesians, as we're going to continue doing so this morning, you find in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 that when Paul was writing to the, to the church here at Ephesus, he reminded them, and thus you and I here today, that it is in Jesus that we have all spiritual blessings, chapter 1, verse 3. And it's a good thing to be reminded of the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. Now, we, we find ourselves surrounded by a world that is hostile towards God, that is hostile towards morality, that is hostile towards any type of authority that would try to put them on the right path, the path of good, the path of life. And sometimes we can find ourselves as Christians perhaps being disheartened 
or perhaps our faith can, can be wavering as a result of uh, the opposition that we receive throughout life. Maybe it is that we find ourselves questioning whether we should keep on keeping on. Well, these brethren in Ephesus, having obeyed the gospel, received this letter from the Apostle Paul telling them not only doctrinal truth about how to conduct themselves in the Lord's church, the organization of the Lord's church, the necessity for unity, but also, also embedded in there, Paul discusses blessings that we have as a result of being in Jesus. Chapter 1, verse 3. And last week we began this series of lessons talking about what we call grace and peace uh, and uh, in this study on Ephesians. And we look at the blessings of, of being in Christ. And today we discuss chapter 2, the spiritual life and the unity that we have in Christ. Now I want to say that if, we're, if, if you've not been baptized into Christ, spiritually you're dead. Spiritually you don't have life. And that may not seem like a big deal to you right now. But rest assured, someday it will. And I would suggest, and I would suggest this: those of us who have, like the Ephesians, obeyed the gospel, and we have an understanding of what it means to be in Christ, we also appreciate, and respect, and find joy and love in the blessings that we have in Christ. I mentioned heaven a moment ago. We are striving to get to heaven, but on the way to heaven. God is still blessing us here in the here and now. And that's what Paul is teaching us about here in the book of Ephesians that we want to stress in this series of lessons about grace and peace. Do you want grace and do you want peace in your life? I believe you do. I don't know what better, uh, what better uh, objective that you could have in this life than to know God's grace and what it means to have peace with God. Our society offers many things under the guise of peace and perhaps even grace for a person, but it pales in comparison to the life of grace and peace that you have in Jesus Christ. And until, we, and until we embrace that and understand the benefits of this spiritual life that we have in Jesus, then we're going to have this emptiness in our lives. And so in chapter 1, we discuss these blessings, and we discuss six things that the, that the chapter that the book of Ephesians chapter 1 lays out to us. Now, we could probably think about others. But this morning, I want to think about six more. And we'll do like we did last week. We'll just go through them a, a little quickly like we did before. But I think about Ephesians chapter 2, and I think about how Paul begins this chapter. Paul begins this chapter by reminding the Ephesians and you and I of what Jesus has done for us, having taken us out of that old life that we once lived. You see, he says here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1 through 3, a reminder about who we once were and a reminder about what Jesus has done for us. He says that you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air, the, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath just as the others. And so here what Paul is saying is, is that in Christ we're made alive. That's where the blessings are, is in Christ. Now we once were outside of Christ, like these Ephesians, until they were baptized in the name of Jesus to get in Christ. And now that we're in Christ, that old life that we once lived, it's behind us now, or at least it should be. That's why I think it's important when you think about when he says here that you once walked according to the course of this world. You once did these things that were according to the prince of the power of the air. You were once living in disobedience. You once conducted yourself in this way. And the way we once conducted ourselves was we gave in to the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. It was all about me. It was all about giving in to, to sin. It was all about giving in to everything that is contrary to God. So much so that it, it was even part of how we thought and how we behave. So he says, and of the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath, just as the other. Now Paul says we used to be that way. So what's the implication? The implication is, is what is such a blessing about being in Christ and submitting to the will of Christ, submitting to his teaching is, is that it changes you. It changes how you behave. And it changes how you think. The expectation is, is that we no longer behave this way anymore. The expectation is we're no longer fulfilling 
the lusts of our flesh and that our mind is no longer worldly minded or a mind of disobedience according to the prince of this world, but instead our mind is guided by the Spirit of Christ through His Word. And as a result of that, there's blessings in our lives. You will have blessings by turning away from that old life that we once lived. Those of us who are Christians today, you understand that you are blessed for having turned away from that life you once lived. Right. So we are thankful to our God that He has given us His Word and has extended to us His grace, His mercy, and given us life in Jesus. That is our first blessing we want to talk about this morning. <clears throat> You know what Paul goes on to say in verse 4? The God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now you notice here the idea, it says here over and over, the idea of in, in Christ Jesus. And this is, and this is something that Paul says in this phrase that he uses over and over through the book of Ephesians. You want blessings, you need to be in Jesus. Amen. And here he says that it is in Jesus that we experience God's mercy, we experience his grace, and those two go hand in hand, I get that. <laughs> But if you really want to know what it means to experience mercy, you really want to know what true mercy is and what true grace is, you think about what God has done for us. God, the sovereign being of this universe, the creator of this universe, had you in mind and me in mind when he spoke this world into existence. Had in mind that he was going to be merciful to us because he knew that we would not be able to be perfect like Jesus. And so in his mercy, he sent Jesus down here on this world, extending his love towards us, towards you, dying for us on the cross. And by doing that, by going to the cross, the blessings abound. We have not only his mercy displayed to us in what Jesus did, but because of what Jesus did, we now have fellowship with one another, but more so we have fellowship with God. And that's a blessing. We think about what he says here in verse 6, and he raised us up together. Now, that means he raised you and he raised me. He raised us up. When? Well, if you go back to Romans chapter 6 and you read these verses here, Romans 6, 3 through 6, you'll find that we're raised up after we've been baptized into Christ to walk in newness of life. And you've been baptized into Christ, and you've been baptized into Christ, and I've been baptized into Christ. We're all raised in fellowship with one another in Christ Jesus. That's called unity. Amen. And this world needs unity. Amen. So many people are looking for unity today. And, and <clears throat> it is nowhere to be found in this world. But in Christ, there is unity. In Christ, we are spiritually alive and we've been given a place of exaltation. That is to say that we are, we have these blessings. We are with him, and notice it says, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He has exalted us. We are, as to, to use a phrase from the Old Testament, the apple of his eye. Our creator sees you and sees me as someone who is uh, the apple of his eye. Right. You are a priest. You are a king. You are reigning with him here on this earth. And then he says in verse 7 that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The more I learn about God and his mercy and his grace, the more I experience the fellowship of his saints and I experience the fellowship of, of God and his son in my life, the more clearly I can see the riches of his glory, the love that he has for us, the more clear I can see heaven on the horizon, the more wonderful it is to sing of heaven. The more wonderful it is to sing about the life that we are striving to achieve with Christ in heaven. We can see that better. We can understand and appreciate so much more His blessings. And really what we're talking about, what we're talking about when we talk about His grace and His mercy and this life that we have in Christ, because we're talking about what He says in the next three verses. That is grace through faith. 
And by this grace through faith, we are new. There's something different about us. We all like things that are new. And when we have something that's old, uh, we typically want to, to replace it with something new. That old life that he mentioned in, in the first uh, three verses, when he said that you were once dead in trespasses and sins, you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the power of the air, when we were living a life of disobedience, and we were, we were walking amongst the sons of disobedience, and when we conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, when we were by nature the children of wrath, which by the way, that doesn't mean that you're born a sinner. That means that was your behavior of life. That was what you did out of, out of habit. You were living this life of sin. Amen. That old life is not a desirable life to anybody, or at least it shouldn't be. Even to those that are living that way, I, I believe within them, they know something's missing. They're looking for something. Well, that something they're looking for is Jesus. And they need Jesus. Boy, that life is a life, then, those verses 1 through 3 teach us about. It's a life that we need to, that we strove to get away from. We're continuing to strive every day of our lives to get away from. And so Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God before, uh, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's such a beautiful picture when I think about these verses together. You know, there's a lot of controversy about eight, verses 8 and 9. Uh, and, and we can probably get into the, the specifics of that maybe in another lesson. But when I think about what we've read up to this point, what Paul says in verse 8, 9, and 10 explain to me why he says what he says. When I think about all that God has done for us, when we think about what verses 4 through 7 teach us about His rich mercy, about His grace, about the life that we have, sitting with Jesus in heavenly places, being exalted, well, we didn't do anything to deserve those things. We didn't earn those things by our own merit. It was by God's grace that He extended those things to us. Just like it was by God's grace that God warned Noah that there was going to be a flood coming, and by God's grace He told Noah what he needed to do to escape that flood, and what Noah did by faith is he obeyed what God mercifully told him to do. And it is by God's grace that we have uh, this love of Christ extended to us, and by faith we, like the, like the Ephesians in Acts 19, by faith obey that message of the gospel. And then we therefore receive those rich, merciful, graceful blessings where we have spiritual life. So the truth of verses 4 through 7 is found right here in verses 8 through 10. And I think it's so wonderful to know that we're not dependent upon our own works. There is no way any of us could devise our own way in through the gates of heaven. There is no way we could. And that's where God's grace comes in. And the faith is on our part. But we need to believe it and obey it. Now, I also find it very just wonderful. Think about what he says in verse 10. Then in verse 10, we're taught that we have purpose. When you have been saved by grace through faith, there's purpose in your life. I imagine when he says here in verse 10 in my mind, when I read, when I read this phrase that, uh, that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared. I picture my mind walking into a room somewhere where, where, you, where you look around and there's tables all around the room and there's activities for you to do on every single table. You, you have something to do. Whatever event it is you're going to, there is, there's something for you to do. God has a, saved us by grace through faith and then left it up to our own volition to decide what it is we're going to do now that we've been raised to walk in newness of life. As we walk, we have purpose. And that purpose was prepared by God. Right. There's work to do. There's work on every hand. Heart to cry for help comes ringing through the land. Jesus calls for reapers. How does that be? What wilt thou, O Master? Here am I, said me. We sing that song so often. And that song is a song to remind us that, that we have purpose. And our purpose is, is to fulfill His work. His workmanship. He shapes you and molds you for your betterment every day of your life as you submit to Him 
as you as you receive his blessings and you submit to the grace and the mercy that we have in Christ. And what that does is that brings us closer to God. Verse 11 says, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, were called uncircumcision by what is called a circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, and at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, where? In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Paul's painting a word picture here for us. He's reminding us that, that through the ages there were two types of people in this world. There were those who were the Jews. There were those who were the Gentiles. If you weren't a Jew, you were a Gentile. And the Jews and the Gentiles were separated. And as a result of that separation, the Gentiles were not able to come near to God like the Jews were. The Gentiles were not able to experience the blessings of God as the Jews were, as the commonwealth of Israel was. This separation then made the Gentiles, those who he describes here as aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers for the promise. They didn't receive the land promise. They didn't receive uh, the blessings that, that, that the children of Israel received. But now... Through the children of Israel, as God's plan culminated, through them, through the seed of Abraham, that is Jesus, now both Jew and Gentile are one in Christ Jesus. Right. And they can experience those blessings together. That's why he's raised us up together. But now in Christ, you who once were far off, that phrase is used about the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 2, Peter, in Acts chapter 2, as he preached the first gospel sermon, and he, and he said in Acts 2, 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He goes on and it says here in verse 39, For the promise is to you, to the, to the Jewish people that were there, to your children, and to all who are far off, as many as as the Lord our God will call. And so what Peter was preaching, and what Paul is reminding us here is, is that no longer, no longer is there this separation. Now in Christ, Gentiles, which is what we are, we can be near to God. Do you want to be near to God? There are people that I want to be near to in my life because I know that by being near to them, closer I am to them, the more joy I will find in life, the closer I am to them, the better off I am, the better off I hope that they can be by me. The thing about being near to God is then is that we can experience His blessings if we're near to God. <coughs> now the Jews, they, were, they rejected the Gentiles. But by being near to God, those who are in Christ, whether you're Jew or Gentile, you can be recipients of the promises of God. And how do we do that? By uh, having Christ's blood applied to us in our lives. I use, I use Romans 6, 6 and Galatians 3, 27 earlier, but if you read Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, which is a book much uh, similar to the book of Ephesians, both written by the Apostle Paul, here you will find that it is when we are buried with Christ in baptism that God operates upon us. And there is where faith comes in. It's through the faith of the operation of God that we are made alive in Jesus. When we're baptized into the likeness of his death and his burial and his resurrection, we contact his blood, we're raised to walk in newness of life, and when we're raised, we are brought near to God. And by being in God's presence, being near to God, we're able to experience his blessings. And we're able to have peace with one another as a result. That's our next blessing. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken the middle wall of separation. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. This world that we live in, religiously and in a non-religious way, is filled with division. There's no unity in the world. There's no unity in a life outside of Christ. But what we find here is, is that what Jesus has done is Jesus at the cross took down this wall and 
by what he has done, these two groups of people, both Jew and Gentile, are now one. And when you obey the gospel and you're unified with Christ through this uh, unity in him, we are a new creature. That creature is called a Christian. Amen. No matter who you are, where you're from, what you look like, your skin color, how tall you are, your geographic location, the language that you speak, it doesn't matter. You are united in Christ with God's people. And you are a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less. That's right. That's unity. That's right. Friends, that's a blessing. We cannot go in this world and find the unity and the blessings that we're going to find in Christ. And that's called peace. Jesus said that he left peace with us. Not the kind of peace that the world has to offer. But his peace. Jesus' peace is spiritual unity. I know that when I go to Japan and I find a cell, Church of Christ there, I'm going to find people that are in unity with me. They may, they may speak a different language. They may even wear a different clothing than me. But I know we're united in Christ. Friends, no matter where you go, no matter who you are, if you're in Christ, you're united. And the we, reason that's possible, Paul says here, that he's abolishing his flesh, the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now, that means that there were these Old Testament commandments that they had to follow, and they could not follow them perfectly. Furthermore, they didn't realize the spiritual aspect of what they were doing either. But what Jesus has done is he's taken that law, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, and he's done away with it at the cross. He's done away with that old law. Now we're under the law of Jesus, and his law teaches us about his grace and about his mercy and about having faith in him, and that faith being an obedient faith, and as we strive to live closer to him, no longer are we striving through these physical ordinances, but to the contrary, you yourself is a, are, are a sacrifice to God. You yourself are a temple to God. And that's what we'll get to here in just a moment. But by being unified in Christ, but by now being one in him, and being brought near to God, we have access to God. <clears throat> there are some people maybe you try to get in contact with and you need access to them. Maybe, maybe you've got to do something that requires you to see the judge down at the courthouse. And it's almost impossible to get a point with him. Or maybe you need to get a hold of a certain kind of doctor. And you just cannot get through to them. And it just takes uh, an act of Congress to get somebody to help you contact them. Some people are just hard to get in contact with or hard to have access to. God's not like that. If you're in Christ, you're reigning with Him in heavenly places, and as a result of being brought near to God, you are, you are standing within His court, Amen. if you will. And you have access to God. And that's made possible through Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16 through 18, He says, And that He might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off, that be the Gentiles, and to those who were near, that be the Jews. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now you see here the unity that we're talking about here this morning. Furthermore, you see where that unity is. Where did he say that unity is? That where, where is it that Jew and Gentile are reconciled? Well, it's in the body, through the cross. Now, you see, in the old days, in the Old Testament days, there were Jews, there were Gentiles. Today, there's still two groups of people. There are those who are saints. There are those who are sinners. Saints and Christians being one and the same. And it is in his body that we find peace. So the sinner who obeys the gospel, like the Ephesians did, becomes a Christian. And, the, and we are... We are one in his body. Now, in his body is interesting because in the last chapter, in chapter 1, one of the blessings that we learned about, in verse 22 it says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Right. Now, Paul says that there is unity and reconciliation to God in how many bodies? One. 
And Paul said that this one body is the church. Right. And this body is the body of Christ. Therefore, I said earlier that if I went to another country, I would find me a sound church of Christ. Are you right? The Paul said this. You see the point? Everything goes back to Christ. Right. Everything ties back into the unity that we have through the Father, through the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And thus verse 18 says, For through Him, Jesus, we both, Jew and Gentile, we both have access by one Spirit. The Spirit gave us His Word, the Word of God that teaches us how to get into Christ. We have access by the Spirit to the Father. Our society celebrates Father's Day today. I suppose how I suppose it is only fitting that we're talking about here today how to have access to our heavenly Father. We have our we have access to our heavenly Father through the unity that we have in Christ Jesus in His body. That's why we're meeting here today. That's why we're here preaching to, uh, to one another, to, to uplift one another, to build one another, and to encourage those that are outside of Christ to get in His body. You want unity. You want blessing. You want mercy. You want grace. It's in Christ. That's where it is. Now, I was thinking about this series of lessons and how that we're talking about these blessings to help uplift each of us who are Christians. But my hope, too, is that if there's any watching or any that's in our audience and aren't Christians, you will see... That you will be, you will see the reason why and the benefits that, that are behind us being Christians. How is it that we go through life and deal with the things that we deal with? The loss of loved ones or the loss of a job or all the different ups and downs that we have in life. How is it that people who are Christians are able to deal with those things differently, more efficiently, more effectively, more joyfully than the rest of the world? It's because we're in Christ. We have His blessings. And so we want you to understand that as well. Our final thing then is, is to know that in Christ, so power points over there, know that in Christ, we are built into a holy temple in Jesus. Here's what Paul says. Now therefore, you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Verse 19 speaks volumes to the fellowship of peace and the unity that we have with one another. And that speaks volumes to how we can conduct ourselves with one another. I know that because we have fellowship with one another and that we're in Christ and that we're striving to be more and more like Christ, that whatever comes our way, we're going to be able to deal with it the way Christ wants us to. We're going to be able to overcome problems perhaps with one another. Perhaps in our marriages. Perhaps with our friends. Perhaps here as, as, as the local church of Christ that meets here at Brooklyn. But he goes on and he says here, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, and in the whole building, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Where? In the Lord. In whom, who? The Lord. You also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. How is that? Well, the reason that is possible is because we are being built by Jesus. We are His workmanship. And as His workmanship, we are being built upon a foundation. Unlike any foundation that men can offer, unlike any foundation that you'll ever find in any other form. It's a firm foundation. It's a foundation that's not going to shift or break or fall or crumble. It is consistent. It is strong. It is powerful. As a foundation that you can trust. You can trust Jesus. You can trust His Word. That it will not change. That it will not, that it will not waver. That His love will not waver. That His love will not uh, change. That Christ will be the same today, yesterday, and forever. And as we go of that, we can grow upon that foundation of His Word, upon the foundation that the apostles have laid by preaching and teaching about His Word. And we can grow individually and as according to His design. And that's going to happen if we allow God to dwell in us through His Word. That's how the Spirit dwells in us, through the Word of God. The more you study the Word of God, 
The more you incorporate Christ-like behavior into your life, the more He is dwelling in you. Right. The more people see Christ in your life. And that's a blessing. In the Old Testament, they had a temple. They had a physical temple. They had, they had uh, a number in the temple, really, if you think about the time that they were destroyed and, and rebuilt and such. But now we don't have this physical temple like that anymore. You are the temple of God. That's why it's so important that we continue to learn what it means to walk in Christ and learn about the blessings that we have in Christ. So in chapter 2, we have six more blessings. The, mer the mercy that we have from God, the, the, the fact that we are new, we're a different person in Christ, that you're brought near to God, that you have peace. We have peace amongst one another. Our, our society is in shambles when it comes to uh, unity versus uh, division when it comes to, to race, when it comes to political ideology, when it comes to so many different things. But in Christ, we can have peace with one another. And most importantly, with God. And have access to Him. To be able to go to Him in prayer. To be able to seek His, His, His wisdom and His guidance as we continue to live and, and strive to be that temple that He wants us to be. Now let me ask you a question as we bring our lesson to a close today. What about you? If you're here and you're not a child of God and, and you're searching for purpose in your life, you're searching for true mercy and grace, do you want that? I think you want that. Do you want a life that is through God's grace and mercy? Let me tell you, a life without God is empty. A life without God is, is bankrupt. Paul said, you're strangers and you're aliens from the commonwealth of Israel when they were outside of, when they didn't have a God. They had no hope. Do you want hope? There's hope in God. God gives hope. He gives true hope. Do you want change in your life? You can't keep doing the same thing over and over and expect different results. You're going to have to have change. That change is in Christ if you're outside of Christ. You're not going to find true happiness, true mercy, true grace. True joy outside of Christ. How important is being here to God? When you think about the blessings that God gives to us, and you think we got we got chapters three, four, five, and six. We got four more chapters to talk about out of this one book of the blessings that we have in God. We've looked at twelve so far, maybe a few more here and there tucked in between. Just imagine how much joyful your life would be if you were in Christ. How near to God do you want to be? Would you have peace if you had access to God? We tell you what, you would. You might not have peace that the world has. We're going to have, we're going to have hardships in this life. But friend, let me tell you, as you go through those hardships in your life, Jesus will be right beside of you every step of the way. And so you can have peace in that. So what if you build your family? What if you build your life? What if you build your marriage? What if you could build that on Jesus? What if you could build that in Jesus? What if you could be in Jesus? Well, you can. We've talked about that. Acts, uh, Romans 6, 3 through 6, Galatians 3, 27. And so the point then is it's, it's, it's all up to you. God's grace is extended to us right here in this book. He is, he is outstretching His arms for you to take that gift, that free gift of God. The question is, will you let Him? Will you allow Him to give you spiritual life? Are you willing to learn what it means to walk in Jesus, to live in Jesus, to live like Jesus, to die in Jesus, to be raised someday, to go to heaven, to die eternity? That's our hope. That's our prayer. If you're here this morning, you're not a child of God, obey the gospel. As you've heard, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, and anger stands forgiven. If you're a child of God it's fallen away, come back to God. Do not throw away the blessings that you can have in the Lord. Don't throw away your soul for, for eternity so that you can be in a, a so, and live in a devil's hell for eternity. Come back to God. Repent of your sins. Seek His forgiveness. And if need be, we'll pray with you for you this morning while together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement. God has